Hello, you're listening to Rural Roots. I'm Boyan First. And I'm Rebecca Caho. And this is your favorite podcast and radio show that asks, what is rural in the 21st century? Except we're not really asking that today, are we? No, we're not. And to be honest, I've been struggling with this episode since May 2016. How come? <laughs> it, um, it just didn't feel right. You're a musician. I'm a photographer. I don't know how musicians are, but when photographers get together, we actually don't talk about cameras. We talk about camera straps, camera bags, shoes, uh, warm gloves. And this episode kind of feels like that. A bit like only university researchers might actually be able to sort of get in and care about it? Yeah, something like that. But it's at the same time, it's such an important topic to talk about. Um, I hope we get that across. And I think that the video you produced uh, around this project will help us actually do that. I think that's what was missing in the original interview. I think you're right. But you also didn't actually say what the episode's about. Good point. Uh, today we are going to talk about research ethics and why it matters how we conduct research, especially in indigenous communities. Uh, but I think it also applies very much in rural and uh, remote communities as well. Our guide through this is going to be Julie Bull. Yes, and she was one of the researchers who worked on the Nunatuvit Research Ethics Project. And that project was partially funded through the Office of Public Engagement here at Memorial University, where I work. Uh, and it was also one of the 2016 winners of the President's Award for Public Engagement Partnership. That's right. I forgot that part. Um, also, just a little bit of background for listeners in places far away from here. Nunatuvut means our ancient land, and it refers to the territory traditionally controlled by Southern Inuit people in Labrador. Right, and so Southern Inuit people lived on that coastline, but also in central Labrador for centuries. And today there's a, there are over 6,000 Southern Inuit who call the territory home. Okay. Let's hear from Julie Bull. My name is Julie Bull. I'm originally from here in Goose Bay, and I'm now living in Toronto. I still do a lot of research work here in Labrador, so I keep coming home, which is lovely. So it's nice to be here right now. Uh, my research, generally speaking, is about research ethics and governance uh, for research involving Indigenous people. And certainly then a lot of the community-based principles and approaches that we use in Indigenous research is then also transferable to lots of other types of community-based work in all sorts of different populations. So basically, anyone who's done any research where they're actually going to be talking to people, interviewing people, has had to follow some type of ethics protocol. It's built right into the way that universities function. Basically, as a researcher, you need to follow certain ethical standards so that your research doesn't cause any harm to the people who you're working with. I remember when I was doing my graduate research, um, you would have this consent form that everybody you, I interviewed would sign, um, essentially would explain to them what the research is about, what is expected of me, what is expected of them, and it would give them an opportunity to withdraw from the research project at any point they chose to. Yeah, and uh, it's all governed through national policy um, that all of the universities in Canada subscribe to. So what's the issue with it? There are several issues. Julie Bogle will talk about one of them that um, she particularly is concerned with, um, it's very individualistic policy. Um, there are other researchers who make very good argument that we kind of have taken this a little bit too far. Um, so there are universities where even if you are, let's say, a folklore student, an undergraduate student in your first year of folklore, you're learning how to interview people and you're going to talk to your grandmother about you know, her favorite recipe. There are universities now that require you to go through the ethics protocol. So for six weeks of your semester, you can't really do anything because you need to get a permission to talk to your grandmother. My favorite story related to ethics uh, is, um, so I did my, uh, my master's here at Memorial in English literature, uh, clearly not talking to a single soul. <laughs> And I still had to do the ethics, uh, the ethics course and actually ended up um, <laughs> learning about the ins and outs of how long it is ethical to withhold food from a seal. And it was, kind of, <laughs> it was just kind of way unrelated to what I was doing. Uh, that's the other problem. Um, a lot of this comes from medical uh, research. Um, so the concept of harm has been really expanded. And there are researchers who worry that because we created this very broad concept of what is harmful, we are starting to limit what kind of research we can do. 
Right. And it's understandable. It's essential that we that we make sure that we're protecting people and, and communities from from research that could be exploitative or harmful research. Um, but as Julie Bull will explain, she's interested in something slightly different. Right. Let's go for it. The biggest uh, difference in the two is that uh, research ethics in, in um, like the mainstream bioethical kind of model is based on the individual. It's all about individual protections, how we uh, have consent and confidentiality and, and uh, conflicts of interest and everything within just the individual person. Whereas in indigenous contexts, like all things, not just research, it's about the community and the collective. So what are then the implications for a community? So maybe there's no actual consequence to the individual participants in the research, but certain research results certainly may have significant implications in cultural, social, or political ways for the community, not just for the individuals, but then for the whole collective. So I think that's a really important distinction that she makes, the focus on community rather than the individual. And Newfoundland and Labrador is actually unique in Canada, which I didn't realize, that we have provincial ethical legislation that covers all research that includes humans. So the moment you start doing research, you are also applying for provincial um, ethics review. Right. And that legislation already includes and covers work in indigenous communities. So at least that part is a bit more streamlined. It is. And... That's good, but it still ends up being very complicated. And Julie gave this great example. In practice, then, for researchers, it, there's, a, there's multi layers of review that needs to happen. And so we're still working out some of the complexities, how we can streamline these processes a little different. So imagine, even for some of my graduate work, I worked with all of the indigenous communities in Labrador. So that already was three community based uh, ethics review processes. Plus, I had to go through my own university institution, which was not in Newfoundland and Labrador. Plus, I had to go through the provincial authority. Plus, I had to go through the uh, regional health authority. So we that's recognize crazy. that that's a lot of effort, especially imagine students who are doing a one-year master's degree and they're trying to do a thesis-based program. How could It would take them that whole year just to get ethics review. So it's still kind of a new thing. We're still working on how we can streamline things in a way that will still be beneficial to everybody because, of course, we don't want to make it in such a way that researchers are only being accountable to institutions. Uh, the movement from within communities, indigenous communities specifically, is that we actually have a say in what's happening in our communities. And so I know here in, in, like in Nunatsuvo, for example, uh, they have a really well-established research office and they have their research priorities for their communities. So if a researcher wants to come in here, their ideas and their, their ways of doing research needs to be compatible with the priorities that are set out within the communities. So lots of researchers, you know, they'll have their brilliant idea that they want to come, and especially within Indigenous context, because it's new, it's exotic, it's, they romanticize how Indigenous people live. Uh, even, like, some of the work I do in the Arctic, people are like, oh, the Arctic is this, like, rugged place that's inhabit. nobody lives there, and it's all these ways. But then I'm like, well, actually, no, like, there's a lot of people that live there, and their way of life is just different than in southern Canada. And it's about figuring out ways, then, that we can uh, bridge those two different worldviews together in a way that's meaningful. Uh, to everybody that's involved with the with the projects. As complicated as all this is, um, it's really important for the communities that researchers work in. Uh, and I think this is the good place to bring that short video you produced um, when this project won the award. Tell me about that video. Yeah, sure. So we produced that here at Memorial University last year uh, after the partnership won our President's Award for Public Engagement Partnership. Something I'd like to note there is that that award isn't just for the researcher. It very specifically rewards a public engagement partnership where a, a memorial researcher and an external community partner has been a, have been able to come together and find new and important ways of um, collaborating on stuff that's relevant to, to um, Newfoundland and Labrador and, and the people and, and places that we serve. So, in this clip, you're going to hear two voices. The first one is Todd Russell. He's the president of Nuna Two of It. And the second one is Dr. Fern Brunger from the Division of Community Health and Humanities here at Memorial. This project on the Nuna Two of It research ethics um, was all about making sure that the research conducted in Nuna Two of It reflects the needs and the interests of the Southern Inuit people. This project, in some ways, is an affirmation uh, that this is the way forward. Uh, for us, it means healthier communities. The Nuna Tuovit Research Ethics Project was actually research on research ethics. We set up a system of research oversight and governance for Nuna Tuovit. 
And at the same time, we did research on the system to see how effective it was. At the end of the day, research needs to be conducted in a way that respects our values, our beliefs, our way of life, our culture, our individuality and our collective consciousness. But at the same time, it must be of some benefit to the community. People must be able to see that it has, uh, there's a reason for it. In terms of how the community members themselves were involved, the, the so-called lay people, this project is, is unique and different in that the idea of lay people makes no sense. Okay, so the community members are the experts. We had a broad range of people bringing different perspectives and it was an approach that uh, we feel has made a lot of sense. And I think what's astounding about it in some ways is that the project gave life to something that in many senses was just common sense. It teased out how to do things properly when you engage with people in a respectful way. So in this project, just to give you an idea of how that works, for example, the, the publications that we have out, they're all co-authored with community members. So Todd Russell and I have an excellent uh, paper out called Risk and Representation in, in Research Ethics, where we critique the national policy guidelines for how to get community consent. That idea, that wasn't my idea with sort of some, some uh, uh, fluffy way of involving a community member. That was Todd's idea. That's the central thesis of that paper. The Nunatuvut model has gathered a lot of attention, nationally and internationally. It's a sense of optimism for me. Things are being done differently. People, uh, people are coming to us now. There is a greater level of awareness, a greater level of respect. We have work to do, obviously, to, to, to take this, this beautiful example of engagement and collaboration out to our communities. And Memorial has uh, work to do to make sure that this type of project reaches more classrooms, more of, uh, of its institutional pieces. I, I have to say that it, it, is, it has been a very encouraging uh, sign about how we go forward. I really like this idea of people in the community being experts on their lives. It's interesting because my graduate research was on small islands. One had 250 people, another had 16 people living on the island. And there was really nobody else to talk to. Nobody else could explain to you what that feels like. So right. this certainly makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense, and it's exciting to see, and it, it feels it just feels obvious um, that these kind of projects can, can be done in ways that are going to benefit the researchers and that are also going to benefit the communities, and where both parties are going to be contributing uh, and, and benefiting from what's happening. And it's really interesting to see this approach to trying to figure out how do you work with indigenous communities, how do you work in small and rural communities. One of my concerns was that how do you balance publishing your findings as a researcher as broadly as possible, because that's what researchers do, and allowing communities to control how some of these findings get published? It makes sense, because when you're in a small community in those sort of contexts, it's hard to feel objective about it. The, the people know the research has been done, and they know that it's about them. Exactly. And it's it's a hard balance to strike. I actually asked Julie Bull about it, and, and she was quite eloquent talking about it. Yeah, that is definitely a challenge, and one that I don't think we've figured out really what the answer to that is yet, because what happens when we do agree up front between the communities and the researchers and what the project will be, but then it turns out actually that the researcher finds something in that project that either the community didn't know or something that they don't want to be uh, public knowledge, which is why it's important that the engagement piece is ongoing. So a lot of, when it comes to ethics, people think even in like the mainstream population, people think, oh, well, ethics is just like this thing that happens at one point in time and then it's over once I get approval from the institution and I get the, the consent form signed, then it's done. But in fact, it's an ongoing process that needs to continue to happen. So when researchers do find uh, results in a community that may have those social or political uh, consequences or implications for communities, it's important that we have discussions to understand what those are. And researchers need to understand their responsibility to, to work 
in ways that are meaningful to the community. So perhaps they find a result that the community doesn't want to be published in an international journal so that everybody can see it, but perhaps there's a way that we can work with the community on those results. So if we find something that is unknown or, or something that we don't want to know, how can, then can we work with the community specifically to address whatever that issue might be without making it this big, again, an exotic kind of way, like, oh, did you know that the whichever community in the north is doing this? Instead of making it, to, again, this kind of... And it, it feels into stereotypes and discrimination and all those other bits. So how can we then work with the communities? Because it goes both ways, right? Like communities have so much to give to the researcher and the researchers of the community. So it's all about kind of that mutual and co-learning bit that needs to happen. And we don't, we don't know the answers to a lot of it, right? And, that, and for researchers especially, that's really challenging because in academia, we think we know all the answers already. We think well, I've been in school for 10 years and I've been a professor for however many other years and I just, I know everything. You can't really teach me anything. Uh, So the best researchers who work in our communities are ones who can kind of leave their ego at the door and recognize that, in fact, they don't know uh, the complexities and the nuances that happen in the communities. Because even if people come up here, you know, from Memorial University, they come up for a week or two, sometimes they might stay for a month or so, but that doesn't give you a real picture of what it's like to actually live here uh, throughout the whole year. So it's a it's an ongoing engagement and negotiation process and every community and project will be different. There is no prescription. There's no list of here's exactly how it works. Uh, it it kind of goes back to the relational piece, right? It's about how we relate to the people that we're working with and kind of letting go of all those, the labels and all the other stuff that we, we put on each other and just figuring out how we can really do work together that's uh, satisfying the requirements. So, of course, if you're an academic, you also need to publish and present and fulfill all those requirements. So those are bits that we need to help uh, educate our communities about, saying, you know, if we're going to work together, I do also have to do all these other academic bits. But then researchers are kind of taking on that extra responsibility to say, so, of course, I have to uh, produce uh, these journal articles and book chapters, but then I'll also have to produce community-based reports uh, And then the language becomes very important because most of our researchers will be speaking English and then a lot of our people in our communities don't speak English. So there's a lot of these extra layers that kind of get put on there that researchers need, the responsibility is on the researcher to build that kind of stuff into their grants, uh, into their work plans when they hire students to do uh, transcription and all these kind of different uh, tasks throughout the project. It needs to also include then providing information back to our communities in languages that they understand. So there's all these little pieces that need to kind of happen uh, throughout the whole project. Yeah, I think that throughout the history of universities, the, the concept of relationships, you know, if, if you go back 50, 60, 100 years, the idea of relationship, that, that wasn't part of what academics did. And so I think it's wonderful that we're seeing such a push in Canada and, and further afield towards that kind of relationship-based research but then you know as anyone who's been in any kind of relationship knows that's where you get complexity too you know I can imagine why some communities would want to have some control over how they're represented in in scientific literature and also to a largely urban public who's most likely to be reading that that that's that holds a lot of power I think that's a huge issue actually yeah uh, and then the other thing with the language issue, that's really interesting, too, because we do live in this very Anglo-centric part of the country. And, and when, it, when it comes to Indigenous languages, uh, we need to recognize that communication can happen in a variety of languages and also in different types of ways. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a report in a Tier 1 journal. But that's it. And up to this point, we didn't really extend that consideration to some of the Indigenous languages. It's really interesting, the whole thing, and Julie is really good at explaining why all of this matters. Indigenous people, I mean, if we historically, we've obviously been here, right, before everybody else came here. So we had science, we had knowledge, we had ways of doing research. We, we probably didn't have language for that. Like a lot of people I work with uh, who speak Indigenous language are like, we don't have words for ethics and governance and research and all this stuff that we say in academia. But we do it, like we actually do what it is you're saying, but we just don't have the same language for it. And so part of uh, the work that I do around research governance is just part of that larger picture of self-government and self-governance in general. So indigenous people across the country and around the world, actually, um, are reasserting their rights to land, especially is a huge one, of course. I mean, uh, in Canada and around the world, land is taken from indigenous people still today. And so... 
uh, it's part of a huge picture of how we are kind of reasserting uh, our role within the society. Because even when we look at climate change and these other bits, we're starting to see uh, mainstream politicians and others who are actually now looking to Indigenous people saying, oh, actually, you guys might know more about this than we ever gave you credit for, especially when we look in the Arctic. I mean, that's where we're seeing the, the biggest uh, physical uh, consequences of climate change. And so suddenly everybody in the world thinks it has a stake in the Arctic and what happens in the Arctic. And so it's just, again, part of this huge movement uh, from grassroots communities. And it kind of works from the bottom up and from the top down. So there's also some policies and stuff that happens in Canada that's coming from the top down, less so. Uh, more of them are from the grassroots, especially if we look in the north. I mean, here in Labrador with Nanatsiavut and then the other uh, Inuit land claims throughout the north, they really have worked hard to establish governance over all things, health, education, industry, uh, all bits. We should have a say. Uh, the common thing that I hear in a lot of work that I do in communities, nothing about us without us. Like, why is it that all these people from the South keep thinking that they know what's best for us when they have no idea what it's like to actually live in these communities? And again, that's, uh, I mean, in this case, is an Indigenous issue, but it's also people who live in, you know, Toronto or Vancouver who are doing research in these small rural communities who... They have no idea. Like, people who have, they're like, well, why don't you just go and, like, have access to all this stuff? Well, like, you can't. Like, I come here and there's days I can't find spinach. Like, simple things that you just don't have the same access to that people in cities just would have no idea, right? So it's about, again, everybody on each side has to kind of teach each other how that works in practice. Nothing about us without us. I like that. But I still think this is going to take a while. Yeah, it's going to take a long time. Uh, in the first episode, one of the first episodes we ever did, I talked to um, Bill Reimer, and he talked about his experience talking with an elder in Yukon. And he asked, you know, they were crafting a set of public policies around families and um, environment. And he said, you know, this is going to take a long time. And the elder said, well, we took us seven generations to get here, so, you know, it's probably going to take us seven generations to get out of it. And hopefully not that long, but I think you're right. I think it's going to take a very long time because the dynamics are so complex. And we forget that this is the whole thing, the whole ethics debate is actually really new. Mm -hmm. And Julie actually talks about that. It's really challenging because, again, the, the resources and the availability and the capacity within our communities is certainly one of the biggest challenges because even the communities that want to have uh, full control and governance over research just don't have the capacity to do so in a lot of communities it's like an on the side of my desk kind of job like my actual job is all these other things but I'm really passionate about having this control in our community so I'll make the time to to stay that extra hour or two hours every day to kind of work on this stuff but like in Canada now there are over 60 uh, probably even more than that actual community indigenous community-based um, research ethics governance structures that happen all over the country so the movement's happening and what's challenging of course is that when we talk about governance of research again it's it's part of the larger piece of governance. So then you get into all the political issues between uh, various indigenous populations, even here in Labrador. I mean, we're, we're all at different levels when it comes to land claims agreements or treaty rights and negotiations with various levels of government. So, of course, it's complex. And people who say, oh, well, there just needs to be like a national border. There just needs to be something centralized. And, of course, um, here in Labrador, I think people really hate the word centralization because all that sounds like is, oh, that means we've got to go to St. John's, right, to get whatever it is that we need, whether that's access to education or health or whatever other service. And so centralization, though, I mean, in theory, maybe it's a good idea. It seems it's easier, right, for the researcher, certainly way easier. I just go to one place and then I'm done. But how does that actually then include the voices of the different people that we're working with? So I don't know what's going to happen with the whole movement because even here in Atlantic Canada, I work with various other provinces as well. I work specifically in Prince Edward Island, but my colleagues in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, who are also developing these different research governance structures, we all are doing similar bits. And like the language we use is similar, the, the stuff we want is similar, but yet there's still so many differences within our communities that we can't even have a regional-based approach yet. Maybe someday we'll get to a point where we realize, okay, maybe there's a way we can all work together. So in, in this ethics piece, for example, one thing that I see kind of working in this province, uh, at some point, hopefully we get to an electronic submission system, first of all, like let's stop printing off thousands of pieces of paper. I don't know why we're still doing that. But like simple things like having this form that we fill out, and then if you're including... 
uh, in this case indigenous people, then you know you would click that button and then it would give you all the options to the communities. Then each community would have submitted their own specific questions and pieces that are relevant to them that the researcher would have to fill out. And so everybody would have different uh, priorities, right, that they would include in that. But then researchers wouldn't have to go through necessarily seven different processes. It would all be embedded within the one process, but still would fulfill all of the requirements for each individual community. So certainly I think perhaps like it may be in the next five years or so we might see that kind of thing happening. And then also around that time, by five years from now, the national policy will also be undergoing revisions. So a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, from like the grassroots perspective, community-based upwards, uh, that kind of information will then feed into how they're actually then um, revising and editing the new policy. Because years when ethics only actually <laughs> became a governance issue in 1998, like people think like that's been ongoing, but the like, researchers I know who were doing research in the 90s are like, we could have did whatever we wanted. Like there was nobody to tell us that that's not the right thing or not the right way. And then it wasn't until 2010 that we had policy around indigenous research. And so that's only six years ago, right? So it's still brand new. So of course, there's still more questions and answers because we don't know yet how we're supposed to be able to fit very different worldviews into this mainstream system. We're really, we're trying to like fit the indigenous piece into this structure that it just doesn't fit. So we need to figure out, there needs to be some kind of like reciprocity, right? Like the institutions, uh, government, uh, universities, hospitals, all of these institutions, the systems need to recognize that their way isn't the only way and that we can still, I think, as I mentioned in my talk the other day, like you can get to the same places, but in different ways. So um, the scientific method is not the only way, right, of figuring out and how did hunters and folks survive on the land all this time before now? So again, like figuring out ways that we can fit those bits into to structures that already exist. So it really is an amazingly new conversation. And it, it seems as though it's one that's evolving as we speak. It, it, project by project, there are new ideas and, and new approaches to this stuff. Um, so I think I know what the answer will be, but is she optimistic about this? I think so. Um, she was maybe a little bit guarded. Uh, but I ask her what makes her excited about her work these days, and this is what she said. When I started doing this kind of work, even as an undergraduate student, like 12 or 13 years ago, I mean, nobody was talking about these issues. It just wasn't a discussion. Everyone thought, well, no, of course, you just go through an institutional review board, and then that's it. I mean, they told me it's fine, so I can do whatever I want now. But seeing actual indigenous communities, especially here in Labrador, we've actually, we're on the, like, the global scale. People are looking to us in Canada for guidance on how to do this, because no other country in the world actually has national policy around how to conduct research with indigenous people. So even though, I mean, of course, lots of complexities and still lots of questions, but we at least have it. So we have that happening. And so the rest of the world is looking to us for that. So that makes me very excited. Makes me very excited that this little place in Labrador that people think, what, what happens in Labrador? Like, when I meet people outside of here, they're like, wow, you're from Labrador? Like, they've just never met a Labradorian, as if we're like this exotic, strange species, right? But like, uh, we're also people, and same as you, yeah, like lots of things in common. Uh, so that makes me excited. It makes me excited to see that governments are starting to listen so slowly. But even when we look at the, I mean, our change in our federal government in the last few years, there's been more, sure, there's still lots of improvement, room for improvement, but there's more happened in the last six months than in the previous decade when it comes to how the federal government has been responding to indigenous affairs and indigenous issues. So that alone makes me excited, knowing that uh, all of the levels of government are recognizing that they don't know, that they, they really, we've not been doing a very good job up to this point, and we can't keep doing the same thing. They recognize that. Whether or not it actually then plays out in practice over the next three and a half years, we'll see. Uh, but so far, it's been doing that. And so my, my passion then is really in how communities have been mobilizing themselves to, to really reassert themselves in this kind of bigger scale of, of governance of research and ethics. So what does this have to do with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the national conversation that has begun? Julie and I talked a little bit about it during the interview, and she thinks that the opening that was created through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is real. vast majority of Canadians are truly interested in learning about Indigenous history and figuring a way forward. Julia gives a really nice example of why engaging with Indigenous people is crucial to move this forward, so I'll play that clip. One of the courses I taught recently uh, was about ind indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous health knowledge systems, 
And so there's not much information available in peer-reviewed journals about Indigenous knowledge systems because that's not how we communicate our knowledge. Uh, a lot of it's oral. A lot of it's not even written down anywhere yet. So, like, you can't expect to find it in the International Journal of such and such. So, like, my students would just look at me like, what do you mean you want me to, like, look at community-based stuff and, like, look in community work? And they just, even at an undergraduate level, they're so trained to only find knowledge the only knowledge that's relevant is knowledge that's peer reviewed and like they don't they can't see beyond that and so I connected a lot of my students with community based work so even for example the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network it's a huge uh, national network of folks they've been doing community based research for like 20 years now and they've really got it like they understand how it works in our communities and they understand how it works in the other systems so they've found ways to kind of bridge those things together I absolutely think that there's been a huge shift in Canada overall in the last six months or so around how we're engaging and treating Indigenous people. Yeah, I feel like we're lucky to have these communities um, and then also the researchers who are really focused on working together to engage on these issues. They're extending the idea of translation so it goes beyond just language and into the, the, the different ways of knowing. Yeah, and it's what's really interesting to me is that here at Memorial, she's not the only one. Um, I just recently spoke with Max Lebron, who is a scientist studying marine plastics, mm-hmm. but it's doing some really interesting um, research around the colonial science, around how we approach communities when we want to do um, scientific research in mm-hmm. those communities. Um, so I think that uh, we are really kind of making a good headway. Yeah, and we're seeing an interest from communities and the people who are being studied in the, and the regions who are being studied as well, which I think is, that's the most essential part right there, is that they're, they're, this is a mutual relationship and that both sides are seeing value to working together and also are taking, um, are taking an active role in what's happening. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's interesting, at the, end, I, um, at, the, at the end of an interview, I tend to ask everybody the same question, which is, is there something you would like to say that I didn't ask you Um, so I asked Julie the Mm -hmm. same thing and uh, I didn't know what I expected but I certainly didn't expect a message to the people of Labrador and this is this is what she had to say I'm really proud of Labradorians you know because everybody here is just so they're, they're really connected to their community and they really want to to be true to the way that life is here and so they're working hard all of the the indigenous groups in in Labrador are working so hard to to really assert themselves within this this mainstream without compromising their own culture and their own traditions again it's about then building that in right to a contemporary context and that's a great way to end this episode it is and i think it went better than i thought it would. <laughs> uh, I mean, such an interesting way at looking at research and how we engage with the communities and recognizing that these communities are a huge part of every research project that we do. Yeah, and, and I think that that shift in thinking could have a potential impact much further afield in terms of all kinds of rural and remote situations. Um, and I think Julie did a great job of walking us through all this. Yeah, she did. And uh, I'm really glad that we managed to do it this way, especially I think that clip that uh, from a video you produced really brought kind of home some of these ideas that she was discussing. So this is the end of another episode. Yeah, what comes next? It's one of those episodes I did over the summer. It's an interview with Dr. Matteo Vituari. He's a scientist at University of Bologna, and he studies food systems, and he's particularly interested in the food we waste. And it's a really interesting conversation. Uh, One of my worst bad habits. So you just listened to another episode of Rural Roots, and my name is Rebecca Cahill. And I'm Brian Fierst. Today you heard from Julie Bull, Todd Rasso, the president of Nunatuavut, and Dr. Fern Branger from the Division of Community Health and Humanities here at Memorial University of Newfoundland. We talked about research ethics in indigenous and rural communities. Rural Roots is produced in collaboration between the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development at Memorial University of Newfoundland, the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, and the Rural Policy Learning Commons Partnership bringing together rural scholars and policymakers in Canada and abroad. The show is supported through a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada grant. We recorded this episode at the CHMR Campus Radio in St. John's. The song you can hear at the beginning and end of the show is called North Star, and it was composed by Laura Bates and performed by Trent Severn.
If you listen to Rural Roots on your campus or community radio, please let us know if you like the show. If you listen to the podcast version of the show, feel free to encourage your local radio station to get in touch if they're interested in broadcasting the program. The show is available to community and campus radio stations free of charge through the National Campus and Community Radio Association Program Exchange, or you can simply download us for free on SoundCloud. And luckily, that's the end of the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> we messed something up here. You read another part. Do you want me to say? Do you want me to say you this just part? Say, yeah, I'll say my okay. part. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join us next time. To subscribe to the podcast, visit ruralrootspodcasts.com. It's all one word, rural, R-O-U-T-E-S, podcasts.com. I'm Rebecca Caho. And I'm Brian Fierst, and you just listened to Rural Roots. You know what I want to do? What? I want us to get so good that we can do this live. Oh, I do too. Probably at some point we could, right? I think we could. I think like... <laughs> Four more episodes.